Welcome to uh, tonight's panel discussion, um, Embracing Impermanence. Um, before we begin anything, though, we're just going to have a couple uh, minutes of silence, and I will begin uh, with a gong, and I'll just uh, let time pass and end with a gong. Welcome again. Uh, this evening's panel will discuss uh, uh, embracing impermanence, uh, the gentle art or gentle practice of letting go in life and death. Uh, it's been organized and sponsored by the uh, Vermont chapter of the Buddhist Peace Fellowship. Before I introduce the panelists, um, I just want to give you a, an idea of the schedule for the evening. The uh, first hour will be uh, questions which the organizers have made up, and I will uh, present them to the panelists. They, they, they're familiar with them already. And it will be generally around the theme of impermanence and how that uh, kind of requires or calls forth the need for letting go. Right? And there'll be kind of variations on that theme. Um, Around what, 8 o'clock, uh, quarter of 8, 8 o'clock, there'll be a 15-minute break. Just before that break, as I said, Glenda will say more about the Buddhist Peace Fellowship. Uh, there'll be refreshments. And then we'll gather again, and there'll be questions from the audience for the last 45 minutes to an hour. So you can be thinking about that as the, as the program continues. So I will just proceed from left to right. Our first panelist is Maggie McGuire. Uh, she's a Buddhist practitioner, primarily in the Vipassana tradition. And uh, she works as a somatic psychotherapist in Hardwick, Vermont. Uh, Gendo Allen Field uh, practices in the uh, Rinzai Zen tradition. Uh, he's a chaplain intern at the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Hospital, and he's director of the Upper Valley Zen Center in Lebanon, New Hampshire. Sharon Keegan is, uh, practices um, in the Shambhala Tibetan Buddhist tradition with the home center in Burlington, Vermont. And she is administrator of the Vermont Respite House, which is a 13-bed hospice residence in Williston, Vermont. The respite house has been there for 12 years? It's been here for 24 years. 24 years, OK. But you've been doing that for 12. And Bill Walden is a professor of Buddhist studies at Middlebury College in Middlebury, Vermont. OK? So, so the first question is, uh, is probably the most general of them. Um, but it's how might the Buddhist notion of impermanence inform the process of letting go, or the need to let go. Um, and uh, what forms, and more particularly, has this uh, taken place or been, uh, been present in your own lives, uh, maybe professionally or perhaps personally? Um, and anyone can start. <laughs> It's just an attempt to try to, you know, uh, introduce these two concepts, both impermanence, which is uh, very primary to a Buddhist notion of reality, and then this other process that we're all familiar with, the need to let go. 
this is all improvisational. And um, improvisation, I think, is responding to the moment. The moment, the moment, we don't know what's going to happen. And that's, uh, that's the impermanent nature, the, the nature of things that are flux. And I, when partly the question is the Buddhist notion of impermanence, what, what uh, my first reaction to this is to talk about the, the three characteristics of reality from the Buddhist point of view. Uh, impermanence, uh, selflessness, and, and dukkha, suffering or dissatisfaction. And things are constantly changing from moment to moment. No, that's a uh, they're interactive and in flux. There's really nothing, no essence, no unchanging something that we are. Uh, because everything is constantly changing, and yet grasping onto it, trying to hold on to uh, and secure our future, to secure our identity in the face of such impermanence, uh, is what brings about unhappiness, brings about dukkha or dissatisfaction. This is, I think, is really, really crucial uh, for the Buddhist view of, of reality. These dukkha or dissatisfaction follows from our attempting to grasp onto things in the, in the in reality, which we cannot. Uh, and hence, letting go is, is their only reasonable response to that. Uh, of course, that's rather difficult, because we want to secure uh, all kinds of things. We want to secure our happiness, our health, our well-being, the happiness of the people that we care about. And we really have very limited powers to do that. Uh, we, whatever has a metabolism is in flux. So we eat and we're going to get hungry again. We inhale and we got to exhale and we have to have more to breathe. And so being organisms, we're just naturally anxious. And again, we can't, we can't control that. So accepting that, I think, is, is again, the only reasonable way to respond to things. But um, can you ask about how this has affected us personally and professionally? Uh, I do teach uh, at Middlebury College. I was on the job market for five years after I got my degree in Buddhist studies. <laughs> and um, I worked in uh, health care at a very low level. I worked in bookstores, etc. Things were really just not certain. And at the moment when I gave up thinking I had to have a professional job, the moment it took five years to give it up. <laughs> at the moment I gave up thinking I really have to have that job, then one just came. <laughs> and, and I have to say that has happened to me numerous times in my life. That letting go in many ways opens the avenue up in uncalculable ways, ways that we cannot predict to have things actually happen that are a lot better. Uh, letting go is not a really pro-American thing, though. It's really, it goes against the grain of a lot of things. But I, I, that's all I want to say right now. Thank you. The concept of letting go is an idea. And then the actual experience of it is quite different. And Many good books have been written where the idea of letting go sounds just great. <laughs> and yet the uh, functional reality of it in a psychological way is rather provocative. Um, so how does it inform, uh, how does impermanence inform letting go? Um, in order to have even the notion of letting go, there has to be some kind of introduction to the uh, idea that there is impermanence, that there is something that is not continuous, that everything's arising and dissolving moment by moment. And so, you know, we, I sometimes think about it, you know, from a child's standpoint, you know, let go of that toy. So what's that mean? You know, you have to open your hand and release it. So from, you know, early levels, we're kind of introduced to the idea of letting go. But um, impermanence is rather provocative. And uh, I think on a, a personal level, 
um, you know, the first kind of real intense hit of letting go was the death of my own mother at a younger age. So at 24, when I was, I just took uh, refuge vows and a Buddhist path and was very um, engaged in the truth of impermanence. And there comes the major teacher, as often arises, um, uh, unexpected death of a parent. And it was one of those um, clarifying moments of this is true. This isn't just an idea, you know, that we as individuals and as a significant entity of called a mother dies and ends. So that really perpetuated me on my spiritual path um, because there was a transmission that took place there. There was a, an intimacy of being with an apparent, um, an apparent parent. <laughs> and then there was last breath. And then what? And so there was a transmission of the gap, the impermanence. Um, that which is not this and not that. And that really um, inspired me, you know, from that moment on. You know, as soon as I could, after supporting my father, I went into retreat, into a, a meditation for a month. And it was like, I want to understand this. What does this mean from a real level that there is impermanence? And what does it mean to live a truth based on how to be in the moment, knowing that past and future are not um, dependable, so to speak. So um, I feel grateful for that personal experience that spurred me on to really explore what that means. And in a professional level, dealing with hospice, there's letting go as the primary message. How do we let go of this life, which we've become somewhat familiar with and quite identified with. So um, that's an ongoing practice uh, within my own mind and heart, but within supporting others. And I know we'll talk about that a bit further. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, I think the <clears throat> opportunity to sit up here and this little stage with lights on it uh, made me brought up the idea as I came over here uh, that there really are no experts in letting go. Um, when you think about it, uh, the idea of expertise is really pretty much the opposite of letting go. And I guess that's why we have this idea of a Zen mind, beginner's mind, uh, that in terms of letting go, we're all beginners. So uh, that said, I think of impermanence as not so much informing uh, letting go, but impermanence is letting go. I mean, impermanence is simply what's happening. Letting go is simply what's happening. It's, it's, a, it's really not like we have to do something about it. It's, it's a question of whether we accord our behavior with what's happening. It's a question of whether we match our intentions and our uh, actions to what is already happening. And <clears throat> I think of this as not something that requires our expertise. It's not something that requires a uh, even a uh, particular practice or a particular uh, way of doing things. It's really just a matter of according with the way things are. So uh, I actually have a, a similar story in terms of the death death of a parent. Maybe these are the kinds of things that propel us into practice. Um, my father, one reason why I was interested in participating in this panel is that my father died on May 14th. Um, 
when I was 13 years old. And <clears throat> it took me many years to really face uh, the extent of my grief over the death of my father, who I was very close to. I think for many years I didn't allow myself that grief, uh, that it was scary to me. And I think for, for many children, the death of a parent is something very, uh, it's very difficult to grasp. It's very difficult to uh, face that. So in a sense, for me, letting go was uh, letting go of my uh, protection against grief, allowing myself to weep and feel the, the pain of the loss of my father. And the great surprise for me in doing that was to realize that through that grief, through allowing myself that grief, I also discovered the uh, uh, reconnection to the things that I dearly loved about my father that I had not been able to really to think about or even consider in that stage of my life where I was uh, pushing those experiences away. It was both a letting go and it was also an opening to uh, the opposite of what I expected uh, in that moment. Uh, that even that, uh, an experience of, of grief itself as being uh, impermanent. I was thinking about um, when I was asked to be on this panel, and I went, who, me? <laughs> um, you know, and just kind of but bowed to it and said, OK, you know, if if, um, you know, anyways, I, I decided to do it. And then uh, subsequently, uh, a couple of emails later, you know, when was sort of describing the questions and was describing how many might people, people might be here. And it was like, well, the first time there was 100, you know, next time there's maybe 200. And there was something about the amount of people that were going to be here that just froze me. And I went, Oh no. And I just, my whole body just went into a freeze. I just, oh, and I'm just, I'm going to just get up there and I'm going to die. I'm going to just, I'm going to die. And I'm like, I'm practiced enough in, in, in the practice of noticing this moment to moment experience. So what is that? What is death? It's like, okay. And so I'm like, the best I can, like oh, my neck, my jaw, the, this, all the different places of contraction, and as until I could start to get my breath back, and went, oh, dying. <laughs> this is about impermanence. <laughs> this is perfect. Um, you know, I thought, oh, I can just get up there and die. I can just <laughs> walk it through it. <laughs> you know, uh, and so you know, I start with this story because. For me, um, you know, I mean, in permits, in a way, it's, it's simple, it's obvious. It's, you know, it's like, of course we know things change, you know. But to, even though we understand it, we don't really get it. We don't live our lives in a way that we really get it. And uh, no judgment, no shame on that. It's just simply the nature of the tugs and pulls. And so for me, I feel like the practice of mindfulness, the continual just simply coming back to uh, noticing, you know, just quieting and noticing what's happening right here, right now, in my body, in my breathing, um, what's happening right here, you know, in my emotions, this is, and that when I quiet myself enough to, to, to slow down and notice, uh, 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 that's where I begin to get a glimpse of the nature of it as, well, I never know if this is too close. <laughs> in terms of, is this okay in terms of speaking? Okay, yeah. you'll all let me know. <laughs> uh, so that way of just beginning to, to, to get, get that, you know, it's, things keep changing, things keep changing. And over time, um, the result for me has been a kind of 
softening into a settling back and a trusting uh, that I can um, I can be with things as they are as they come up. I can be in accordance with them. I can you know keep I can just keep doing that um, uh, in a way that's very kind of impartial or not judgmental um, and. Um, I'm just curious about time. You're good. OK. <laughs> so I was thinking about um, an experience uh, I had on a retreat. Um, I was on a, anyways, a long, intensive retreat, um, which is really, for me, has been helpful in layering below the surfaces of what, there's so many layers of what we hold. And I was working through a, a very deep hurt or snag in, in a break in my relationship with my sister. And um, one of the teachings that one of the teachers offered was just this very simple question of, what is this? And so I just kept bringing myself back to the edge of whatever I was experiencing and kind of going through, you know, the anger. Well, what is that? What is, what is that? And it would. I would, you know, find the next level of, well, I'm hurt. And I would go through, well, what is it? What is it? What is hurt? What is, you know, not an intellectual level, but just what's the experience of it? So I kind of kept layering through this hurt into, oh, she doesn't understand me. Uh, what's the worst of that? What's, you know, just kept layering into this experience until I, I, I felt like I fell into the bottom of, Oh, I feel so alone. I feel so alone, unwanted, unconnected. And that even and I just started sobbing and it was like there's something about the connecting with that deep uh, att attachment or connection that um, allowed me to understand what was what, what, what kept me bound into being able to let go, so. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the more you talk, the harder it is to even formulate questions about this, but here we go. Um, so I was surprised that a lot of your responses were very personal, right? Um, so in this case, um, because you're also all professionals, right? Teachers, body workers, chaplains, hospice workers. Um, how would you think about or mm, talk about the guidance that you might give to a student or to a patient um, or to a client? Um, you know, in order to help them to let go in order to uh, get them involved in this process that you've all talked about, um, you know, that was, uh, say sometimes it just happened to you, I, I guess. But, you know, we're also aware that we can help other people to, to try to let go. How would you um, speak about that from your own professions? Should we start again? <laughs> this is starting to be a habit. <laughs> and, and the students will sit, start to sit in the same seats every class. Um, so habits are very quickly, quickly be made and hard to break. Um, you, you, I was thinking about coming here in terms of. Um, uh, embracing impermanence and thinking about old age and death and somewhat expecting a lot of us were thinking about that, given our age and the obvious processes of degradation that we have to uh, live with. I, I, I do, and I'm very well aware of that. Um, but the transition from adolescence to adulthood is, uh, is also very much a, a kind of a death. A, a, a death of a, a, a childhood type of a child identity and a, a dissolving or coming apart and then a reformulation into something like an adult personality which takes time and uh, being at a college you know there's a four-year uh, period there for a lot of people um, 
and they fall apart. <coughs> and they fall apart. Uh, if they come into my office and they feel that I'm uh, a, a receptive, caring person, then they fall apart in my office <laughs> sometimes. And I, a, a lot of it is really, what's really important, I think, is that they, they understand what they're feeling. And, and a lot of what they're feeling are the truths about growing up and the truths about, about losing. Uh, their grand, a lot of them lose their grandparents at that time. Uh, a lot of them, their parents divorce. Once the kids move away, they figure that you know, it's not so important. Um, they lose their sense of identity back home where they know everybody. And, and getting in touch with that, I think, is, is really, really important. And the, that, that's at a sort of an emotional level. I think what's also very important, and luckily I have the opportunity to be teaching Buddhism pretty much every day, uh, both inside and outside of my office, is that, is that they recognize that, that the ideology of permanence and security is not actually true. There isn't, there isn't security. And, and they've been told that that's what they should seek after. And when they recognize so clearly that it isn't there, they're confused. Because their intuition, their, their feeling, their gut feeling, is there isn't security and, and dependability. Because things are always falling apart in front of them. And a lot of, I know this is going to get back to the, one of the last questions. Uh, um, a lot of the culture, is about telling them, no, no, that's not true. You can just sort of, you know, smooth over everything and everything's going to just be fine, which is bullshit. <laughs> and, and they need intellectual ideas or concepts, not intellectual, but concepts, concepts like impermanence. And that the, the identity is an ongoing process, not a something. And without these kinds of tools, conceptual tools, there, it's very easy to be really confused. And, and I think that Buddhist practice in many ways is this kind of wonderful balance and dance, you could almost say, between our, our physical and emotional processes that we could immediately discern and, and conceptual ways of, of trying to figure out what exactly impermanence means and what our patterns, our emotional patterns, particularly our, our patterns of, of reactivity, emotional reactivity, what pushes our buttons. Uh, and this is a, it requires both our, our gut, our heart, but not both, all three, our gut, our heart, and our head at the same time. And one of the things that, this is a little joke that I learned uh, not too long ago. Uh, <laughs> do, do you know why your parents can push your buttons so well? No, no, why? Because they're the ones that put them there. <laughs> I think in my experience, both for myself and for students and for individuals who are dying, uh, the field of kindness is most essential as an environment to greet someone, to feel emanating um, because most of our world is rather harsh, rather um, landminded with places of self-judgment and, and criticism and not adequate enough and um, all these uh, self-doubts about one's inherent goodness and purity. So how to help um, individuals in all life stages, and there's many life stages that we all go through. There's many letting goes, many kind of deaths that happen just moving through our life um, relative to the major letting go that we think of as death. Um, so I think kindness and then um, often I think in order to let go, there needs to be a feeling that there's a fullness, because one can't let go if there's a sense of deprivation or nothing to let go into. So it's sometimes a, 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 con a contemplation about 
what is one's inherent richness? What is there already? Rather than thinking of letting go into a void or um, darkness. So it's sometimes a, a review or a reconnecting, supporting folks to reconnect, supporting myself to reconnect to um, original strengths, original wisdom, original knowing before we got confused, before we started a, a path of um, doubting or being uh, overwhelmed with messages of needing to bolster our armory or our fortress in order to survive. And so there's a, a thoughtful inquiry that happens um, if people feel embraced by kindness and, and non-judgment of being able to um, question, look thoughtfully at what has gotten me to this place of deep fear where I can't let go or I don't even trust my next thought as being a worthy thought. And, you know, that takes uh, a certain steadiness of the, in the holder of the space to have met one's own doubts, to have met one's own um, uh, fearfulness. So as myself, as a practitioner, it's uh, always cultivating that uh, vulnerability in my own self and my own ability to be naked with my own mind as it's arising. Uh, the places of the sparks of fear, the places of doubt, but in a cradle of loving kindness, of non-judgment, that there's a natural human process where we've picked up certain things that create a, a sense of um, forgetfulness about that original wholeness that we are. So how to mirror that back, uh, give people a sense of confidence of their goodness, of their uh, already inherent wisdom rather than um, only going to a place of, of letting go rather than opening up to that which has always been there. So um, those are a few thoughts to offer. Thank you. I often think of the practice that we do uh, the meditation practice uh, in the Zen tradition that I'm familiar with as practice or, or training in sitting in the midst of paradox, sitting in the midst of contradiction. That there's something inherently paradoxical about sitting quietly and still and being uh, alert and awake Usually we think of awake as being active, and we think of stillness as being sleep. But the meditation <coughs> practice uh, in, in Zen tradition holds both of these qualities at the same time. And that our lives, in countless ways, embrace paradox, that we face the uh, underlying paradox of being born and yet dying. And that we would like to think of ourselves uh, as we were in age 21. <clears throat> I still enter a room with young people and assume them to be my peers, uh, only to realize that they look on me and think of me as their grandfather. <laughs> But the challenge that we face is to hold both our life and our death, and to recognize that both life and death are who we are, that we both live and we die. So I also think of the meditation practice of, of Buddhism as descended from, or uh, borrowing from the yoga tradition of uh, embodied, an embodied practice, an embodiment of uh, uh, conscious awareness. And that this 
embodiment begins or focuses on breath and breathing as, as this inherent activity that's happening all the time. And this breathing activity is one that involves opposites, in-breath and out-breath, that are happening sequentially, and yet they are also happening together. So this characteristic of breath is also seen in the Buddhist tradition as characteristic of so many phenomena in our lives, night and day, uh, spring and fall, or winter and summer, um, that all of these forces that involve the, the meeting of contradiction, the meeting of contradictory forces, that are constantly in dynamic relationship to each other. And it's that dynamic relationship which is the Buddhist, well, I should say the Zen Buddhist, uh, understanding of impermanence. It's that impermanence is this dynamic relationship between opposites. And it's, and it's learning to live in the, in the midst of that paradox that is ultimately a letting go. It's letting go of our tendency to grab on to one side or the other, to grab on to life, and in some cases to grab on to death and make that our, our identity. But the practice, the practice of letting go, <laughs> I forgot to tell you to turn your cell phones off. <laughs> so I, I think of this practice of letting go, of this practice of being non-judgmental, is the practice of, of living in the midst of paradox. Therapist, um, I... Um, I have a, a particular um, orientation to really inviting people to become aware of their embodied experience. And so, um, so much of our, our, um, uh, our patterns, you know, our reactive patterns get held, in, you know, in a body, in our mind. Every state of body is a state of mind. Every state of mind shows up in the body. And so, I'm often, in meeting people um, and in listening, you know, very, you know, like really receiving and listening carefully to where they're at, but in that, you know, inviting, um, inviting pauses, inviting spaces to hear, you know, you know, kind of pulling out one thread. When you said that, you know, when you said that one thought, what's it like when you listen to it? What happens inside you when you when you hear that thought? So it's like in a way I'm kind of like inviting people to layer into what's their embodied experience of what they're thinking and what they're feeling, and because um, I find that um, um, that you know coming into a, a sense of you know even just a question of are you breathing, and you know some people go, well yeah. You know, uh, how do you know you're breathing? You know, it's like, huh, I, I, oftentimes we don't really know that we're breathing or not. I mean, obviously we're breathing, but at some level we're not. We don't know how we hold our breath, and the breath is such a good indication of how we may be holding our body. And uh, I work a lot with, um, uh, you know, softening into the body, you know, kind of, guiding through. Um, one of the ways I work a lot with is just inviting people to drop into their belly. Can they feel their belly? Can they feel their diaphragm? Diaphragm is a great entry point into, uh, and even just as I'm talking, you can, you can just, you know, your mind may already be going there, of just kind of noticing, you know, your own diaphragm, your own belly. Um, there's 
a way that it just, it, it, it's a gr gateway into all of the places kind of where we may be holding, um, you know, in our lower trunk, our upper body, along our spine. And so this little by little finding, finding where um, they're most receptive to ease, where they're most, where they're already can find some place of ease and to follow that and, and you know, invite that uh, to spread, to notice. And so little by little, uh, you know, this practice of inviting awareness to the density that our minds take, our bodies take, and little by little invite them to, as they become aware of, actually the body will soften it. Like when the, when the body is aware, it actually knows what to do. We don't, we're not manipulating it, but we're allowing it to reorganize itself towards ease because the body wants to organize towards ease, and it's organized towards comfort. And in this way of softening, releasing, letting go, um, uh, that there's a sense of becoming more grounded, more able to feel a sense of weightedness, yielding into the ground, gravity, and the simultaneous lightness that comes with the more we let go, the more we, um, you know, the more we drop into, the more we lighten and let go. And so there becomes an increasingly more, uh, it's more spacious that we can, over time, um, actually rest in just open awareness of, oh, this feeling, this thought, you know, that that's the, the fine, the fine process, and it's like working with one little thread at a time. Um, what I find is that um, people's problems no longer are problems. I mean, I think our experience, I don't know, I'm trying to find how to say this. There's a way that when something comes into being, comes into consciousness and is known, you know, in its stickiness, the more you rest with it, it actually dissolves. It no longer exists. It just doesn't exist. It's gone. It disappears. So the letting go and the impermanence is just a natural fruit of this way of working. So uh, one of the themes that's uh, that I'm hearing, you know, in this discussion is this. Um, is this uh, direction, say, by the culture for security, right? And yet, when Maggie, when you spoke, you spoke about um, an awareness of the breath, uh, a kind of relaxed sense of oneself as a, as a comfort, you know? And I'm, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, um, so I guess what I'd like to address is the relationship between those two and how they're understood um, and this, this one question may, may do that. Um, I'm wondering if uh, letting go can take forms that transcend the personal. Um, can it be expressed uh, through the family or through the community? Or um, can letting go be seen uh, culturally as well as personally um, which I, I think you've all very well addressed. Um, or do you think about it that way at all? Yes, I, I think that letting go is ultimately both personal and societal. I, I think, and this, <clears throat> this is not uh, a very well-informed opinion, but I, th I have an image in my mind of the uh, vision quest of Native American tribes, of this uh, custom of young people, probably historically it was mostly men, young men, going off in the wilderness by themselves for a period of time and having an experience, a vision that was brought back into the village so they would leave their society, leave their families, have this vision, come back into the culture, and be given a new name. And that vision would be honored. And that person reintegrated into the life of the village with, with a, a respect for that vision and, 
And in this way, a personal transformation, a personal insight, was also a guiding insight or transformation for the culture itself. And so I look at our society, and I look at the fact that our universities and colleges are descended from monasteries in Europe. So we have very much this same instinct of people, well, colleges may not look like monasteries anymore, but there's this same instinct that young people need to go away, or that people in our culture need to leave the requirements of work and society in order to investigate a vision for the future, a vision that is both personal and transformative of the society. And unless, unless individuals make that effort, unless we make that effort in our own lives, then the society itself will suffer. That the society itself must adapt to change. The society must accord with impermanence. And the way that society uh, ex in explores new creative options is through that personal transformation that each of us can do. <clears throat> so I think these, uh, that the personal, or as we used to say in the 1970s, the personal is the political. <laughs> So sharing that same um, feeling that society, family, and society is an outgrowth of individual. So to the degree that we're able to cultivate a personal experience, a genuine experience beyond concept of letting go within our own personal relationship, meaning letting go of the battle, letting go of the, the internal conflict of uh, this is good, this is bad, this is pure, this is wrong. Um, so the, the taming of the mind, which happens within meditation of sitting quietly, um, being with oneself in a non-judgmental environment of the practice, allowing mind to arise and create whatever it's going to create, and then not um, creating a war out of that, to be able to uh, acknowledge and see and let go each moment, continue to let go. So we're our own little uh, internal culture for a bit, and uh, we have lots of things going on in our minds. We have whole dynasties going on in our minds, and complete universes, and, um, and then we bring it back to simple breath, thought, dissolve. And um, so that brings it back to a personal attainment of some kind of stability that whatever is arising in the mind does not need to be an outgrowth of aggression um, if we've tamed our own uh, sense of aggression here, then we can manifest a natural compassion and generosity of accommodation with others, and that would mean family. And then family expands to neighborhood, to town, to state, to country, to countries, to universe to Mars, to Jupiter, expands, expands, expands. So that, um, that idea of cultivating, um, letting go is mostly ego grasping and, and contracting into mine and protecting this, which through our practice and through our uh, recognition that there is no such thing as this separate from that, then that sense of interconnectedness that we're all sharing the same aspiration for happiness and well-being. So whether we're here or whether we're in Africa, whether we're in 
you know, lower Manhattan, there's still that human heart that's beating that is trying to manifest and express its original wholeness and its goodness and its um, natural interconnectedness, its natural sense of absence of division. We've just kind of gotten lost over time. So um, I think there's grand uh, expression of taking personal integrity of dissolving this sense of separateness with our own um, sense of wholeness and then that will naturally radiate out to others. So peace is a natural outcome of that, um, whether it be in this moment with myself, but in relationship with the next person I meet. I'm not at war, and we're not at war with each other. So it's a real um, harmonizing energy that once we start to dissolve the sense of separateness, then it radiates out. Thank you. You could say it was peace fellowship. Well, that's, that's coming in a few minutes. <laughs> you know, uh, probably a good portion of you are parents, and, and I think in, um, particularly in, our, in, in, in this modern Western society with, where we foster independence to such a, a degree that we do, um, one, of the, one of the ways that we just really have to let go is we have to let go of our children. But before we let them go, we have to let them be who they are, instead of putting them in all these little boxes. And, and I think that letting go of our preconceptions about who they are or who they should be is really difficult when you spend hours and days and months and weeks and years and decades protecting them. And then you have to let them go and hurt them, have a chance to hurt themselves so that they can learn. If, if they don't have a chance to take risks, they're not going to learn and they're going to be overprotected and they're going to actually hurt themselves more deeply in the long run. And, and uh, I think this is a really difficult thing. And actually, this, is a, this American system is an aberration in human history where children just take off and leave and the mass numbers that they do. Um, but it's nevertheless, it's, it's, it's our culture. So it is, it's a deep, deep practice of letting go and loving at the same time. I think it's really challenging. Um, the other way in which impermanence um, is very, very profound, I think, at a cultural level, has to do, um, oh well, I've had the uh, good fortune of spending many years of my life in Buddhist cultures uh, in South Asia with Tibetans and then people in Nepal. And the Tibetans lost complete control of their country in the 50s and 60s. All the Tibetans that I know are refugees, all of them, uh, either recent or, or older refugees. And their sense of, of loss, uh, of, of, of losing their homeland, losing control over their culture, losing control over their language, um, and making sense of a world as a refugee in a, if I may say so, a piss poor country like India or Nepal. And that this is a meaning, that they can find meaning in this through Buddhist ideas. This is our karma. We, have, we have, are now in this situation. Things are impermanent. We lost everything, but here we are with each other to whom, with whom we can react with caring and compassion. And that caring and compassion extends to dogs on the street. It isn't just fellow Tibetans. And, and my experience in, in Nepal, where I, I will be going actually in a couple of weeks, is, is much the same. It's, it's, they have a culture which understands impermanence and loss, and hence they have the, the, the resources, the, 
the psychological, the social, and the cultural resources to respond to, to great loss. And, and I'm not saying that Buddhists are, have a monopoly on this. I, I don't think that's true. But these are really useful frameworks for understanding what inevitably happens to all of us individually and will inevitably happen to every single political regime. And, and being able to understand that kind of change and transition, I think is, is really, really crucial. And you know, I, I've been very lucky to be able to see people for whom the greatest kinds of loss, uh, other than immediate families, of course, which I think is entailed in that, but that, that's everywhere. They've been able to make this really meaningful, meaningful in their lives. And um, I think that's a social dimension that that we can learn a lot from. I've actually just been really appreciating what everyone else has been saying, um, and in a way echoing. I think um, I think the practice that I just will always keep coming back to, you know, personal, you know, sort of larger ripples of that um, in terms of family and our communities, um, is just is always coming back to hard practices of working with kindness and care. Uh, and I think that in order to act in the world, in the world of suffering, um, the, it can be so overwhelming. Um, and if we, if we start at the place of where it's too hard, we'll get overwhelmed, we'll, we'll fall into despair. We'll, and, and so we have to keep coming back to finding our heart, finding our own heart finding heart in other people, um, that sense of what is it in life that we already love and appreciate? Um, you know, where is our gratitude? Um, where is our natural generosity? And so that when we, when we can kind of warm the heart or prime the heart, we're in a much better position to um, meet the pain or the suffering um, in our families, our communities, the world, however, big or small, um, we need to have some buoyancy uh, and strength and courage to actually open to the pain, the suffering, and bear, to witness it and bear witness it without losing heart, that, 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 that compassion. Um, and uh, so that we don't lose heart and we can find the energy to move into whatever um, vision, whatever, that, that we're touched by suffering and we care, we want to act from that place. And then to, to, to have a clear sense of what our direction is, what our action might be, and it's, it's like a circle. It's like we have to keep coming back to re-engaging our heart in order to see it through in, in some way, so. Well, thank you. Um, it, it's it's quarter of eight. I, I think this is actually a, a good time to to stop, uh, take a little break. Uh, Glenda is, um, is going to say something about the Buddhist Peace Fellowship. We are so honored that you all came out on this beautiful evening when you could have been digging in your garden or running down the streets of Montpelier, uh, and you chose to sit with us. The Buddhist Peace Fellowship is sponsoring this event, which is the third such Buddhist panel discussion in Montpelier. And I hope there will be a fourth and a fifth and many more. As I was sitting there listening tonight, I thought, well, what does the Buddhist Peace Fellowship have to do with impermanence and letting go? And especially as Sharon spoke, it became very clear what peace has to do with impermanence and letting go. And I hope that came across to everyone else. Uh, the Buddhist Peace Fellowship actually goes back to 1978, the national organization. Uh, 
formed as a catalyst for socially engaged Buddhism. And this is just a couple of sentences from the national mission statement. Our purpose is to help beings liberate themselves from the suffering that manifests in individuals, relationships, institutions, and social systems. Buddhist Peace Fellowship's programs, publications, and practice groups link Buddhist teachings of wisdom and compassion with progressive social change. The Vermont chapter, which is the only chapter in Vermont, uh, we meet in Montpelier. We would love to have any of you join us who would be interested. There is a sign up over on the table there to give us your contact information so you can let us know if you'd like to, to join us or learn about our activities. Uh, we have <coughs> marched in demonstrations in Montpelier for causes that we felt were in line with our spiritual values. We presented a movie on drugs and prisons, uh, which had a wonderful turnout and discussion at the Kellogg Hubbard Library uh, with a film that didn't blame anybody, but showed with great compassion and understanding how people got involved in being prison guards or addicts or whatever. Um, we will be sponsoring again the Peace March on Hiroshima Day in August in Montpelier. So those are a few of the activities, but we meet monthly. We do a reading. Uh, we have a discussion. We think at this time of year what's going on in the legislature that we should be aware of. Uh, so we're active on many fronts, both being aware of peace within ourselves and what we can do in the world outside, whether it's families or the state of Vermont or Washington, uh, to advocate for peace and to, and to be peace. For me, it is very important in activism not to be active from anger. Outrage at uh, injustice, yes. But anger at people demonizing people as part of activism uh, is not what I want to participate in and is one of the big reasons why I joined the Buddhist Peace Fellowship. So I'm sure we're all ready to stand up and have something to eat and drink and look at some of the literature that's on the tables. So uh, let's do that. Okay. Thank you. And so we'll reconvene in 15 minutes. I, I came late because of the run, so I have this fear that my question was like the very first question you asked. I'm hoping it's not. Um, so I, I touched on this briefly when I was talking to um, up front, and it occurs to me that, that you're talking about a paradigm to death, which is sort of accepting it. And, and it's, that's different than the John Wayne approach, which is to, which is to fight, it, right? And so, so the thing is, when I think about you know how the movies speak about this approach of fighting death, don't give in to death, you know, fought a valiant fight kind of stuff, it it implies that fighting death will get you more life. Maybe you'll, you know, if you, if you just don't get into it, you'll, you'll succeed at extending the duration of your life or in some other way benefit from having caught in one. And so I'm wondering, first off, is that is that paradigm just wrong? And and if it's if is it is it a legitimate approach to to facing death, despite the fact that if you do that, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna have kind of a, a horrible wake-up call in the last few days of your life. <laughs> and notwithstanding that, it's nevertheless the case that it's, it's, a, it's a common approach, and I wonder whether it's, whether it's a wrong one. OK, who would like to pick up the microphone first?
<laughs> so I, I, I don't think, uh, I'm not, I don't find it useful to ask whether it's right or wrong, but uh, whether it works or not. <laughs> um, I'm, my own present experience is working in a hospital, in a large uh, teaching hospital, Dartmouth Hitchcock. And I would say that in our culture these days, we continue the fight against death with all manner of technology. Uh, and that there's uh, a lot that we can do to prolong life. And it turns out that that creates a big problem. Uh, so, you know, the fight against uh, death is not without its complications. At some point, if we fight death and fight it and fight it, we face the we still face the problem of how to die well. And I think that that is a big problem in our culture is how do we die well is can we have a healthy death? Is there such a thing? Because over and over again, we see people who are supported on technology uh, in the hospitals and it's it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great struggle. It's a great struggle for the families to decide, you know, when do we pull the plug? When do we say enough is enough? It's a struggle for the, for the nurses and for the doctors. And everybody's trying to figure out how do we deal with all this new technology? How do we make uh, the right decision? So, uh, I think sooner or later, the, uh, our efforts to preserve life have to confront the question of how do we deal well with death? I don't think we can avoid that. Mm -hmm. Article in the New York Times last Sunday, and it talked about the Victorian view of death and you know really treasuring things from the person dying, death masks, locks of hair, uh, and seeing death as part of the, the nature of life being ephemeral. And if you, if you take a medical approach to, to death, then you're mm -hmm. always a failure. Yeah. You're always a failure. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I haven't heard of any physician who's succeeded in, in fighting death and winning. So on the one hand, you have, you have fighting death means that you become a failure. And the Victorians treasured their memories of the dead person and uh, treasured photographs of the, of the dead body, death mass, <laughs> treasured things that reminded them of the life that had been lived. So I just wanted to mention that. I think our fight for, for life is, is a current uh, phenomenon that if you just go back to our culture, 100, 150 years ago, you'll find something very different. Just a little further elaboration. Um, you know, one way of living is to try to survive at all costs. And um, then when it's time to die, you haven't really lived because it's always been a battle of just surviving life. And so I think there's something about a, a contemplative experience where there's not necessarily seeing death as the all-encompassing enemy, but how do we live in the present? How do we live in this moment? How do we appreciate the sunrise? How do we, you know, touch our child's face with tenderness? How do we feel the tears come down our eyes and not feel embarrassed uh, about living? So there's something about not trying to bully ourselves through life. Um, and it is true, you know, often within the hospice scenario that I'm in, um, people have been through a lot. Mm -hmm. They have tried many things naturally, and any of us would do it, you know, to try to prolong, when you can, this life. Because in our Buddhist tradition, you know, being human is a very precious opportunity to be able to hold this mind, this heart, the spirit synchronized in order to, 
to continually waken to our true nature. There's the preciousness of human birth is held highly. So it's not something just to toss away. Um, but then there's also when does the um, dread of death and the panic of dying um, obscure the wisdom of how to live as fully as one can to one's death. So it's, it's a delicate balance within any of our lives. Um, but there's something about, you know, the warrior mentality of conquering death. It can't be conquered, but it, it, we can live strongly. We can live fully and um, know that there's letting goes that happen all the time. And then there is death, which is a letting go. <coughs> So it's an interesting uh, journey. Uh, the paradoxes of life. And, and one of the paradoxes, it seems to me, is that we're constantly changing. We're not the same person we were 20 years ago. But in another way, we are. We do have this <laughs> life story that we live. So that paradox seems to be there. And I was wondering if you might talk about that. The, the, the impermanence, and yet there seems to be a permanence, at least for the length of time that we live. Uh, traditional Buddhists talk about um, a mental stream. That what we are, it, the, the better analogy is like a stream. The stream has continuity. Uh, it has a kind of predictability. It has a kind of individuality. But everything is in constant flux. The, the riverbed, the water, the current, its patterns. It's so things are constantly changing. So there is that kind of continuity. And the continuity is a really important part of understanding our habitual behavioral patterns and, and, and how habits form, in a certain sense, the kind of riverbed and currents that are what we are and why they're so hard to break. And a lot of grasping onto things is trying to we keep recreating, in a certain sense, our identity as to who we are uh, out of fear of impermanence. And that grasping on is what prevents us from recognizing that things are constantly changing and, from let, and, and prevents us from letting go so that we can actually respond to circumstances that arise from moment to moment. And, but these are just more habits. These are just habits. And they get deeply entrenched like a, a, a riverbed. And so they're hard to break, but they're, they're nothing more than what we reconstitute, really, from moment to moment to moment. And that's why breaking through them can happen in a, in a momentary way. Uh, nevertheless, we have a, a, what one uh, philosopher says, we have a narrative center of gravity, that the story we tell about our lives. Like all stories, it's fiction. But it, it should be a good and healthy fiction. Uh, I would just add that there's uh, no problem with having a, a self. <laughs> it's a good thing to have a self. You need to have a self uh, to cross the street safely and not get hit by a car. Um, <laughs> We all, all of us grow up in culture learning what, the skills and the identity that we need to earn a living, to uh, navigate society. But I think what, in my mind, what Buddhism is pointing to is that that's not the whole story. And if we get stuck on that and think it is the whole story, we're in for a lot of disappointment. <coughs> and that to recognize that that self, that uh, and the const and the the information that we accumulate that allows us to navigate society is is not is not all that we are. That we also have these moments of experience in which that idea of who I am, of my self-story, is no longer relevant or necessary. 
and that everybody has those moments of experience and that they're very important to recognize those experiences as also in some larger sense who I am. And those moments in which we are able to step outside of the confines of that self-definition are moments of compassion, they're moments of, of non-judgmentalness, they're those moments in which we are able to step outside of our own small container and embrace the rest of the world in a different way. And, and those experiences turn out to be very, very important, <clears throat> both for us personally and interpersonally, and also in terms of, of how society functions. I also really liked that you brought up about um, paradox, because I feel that what is uh, sort of like the job of every person is to experience that play and to find their own balance in that. And, and, and a lot of people don't ever try to, because they're so hooked into whatever you know, the propaganda of the society tells you is, is necessary. Um, but, um, do I have a question? <laughs> <laughs> that is my question. So, uh, just speak about that a little. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what is the place of play in the act of letting go? Uh, because, you know, we're often very serious people. You know? and, and, I, and I think what you're pointing to is, is just how uh, there's something about play which at times does kind of hold this paradox. And, Anyway, that, that's, that's what I heard. In a way, the way I experience it is, like, I try to do whatever it is that I'm trying to accomplish, and I get frustrated, and so I surrender, and that's when everything falls into place. You know, th things turn out way better than I could have made them. And, and I've experienced this a lot of times in my life, and so I, you know, it, it's like the riverbed that I have been able to <coughs> recognize. Um, in my life. Thank so, you. Yeah. Would anybody like to, to comment? I just think I have a funny story. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this is real, but I was, I was, um, a number of years ago, my son decided to play a trick on me in the little video store in our town. And he noticed that I was in the store, and um, and he decided to. My car was parked up front, so he decided to move the car up the block a little bit, <laughs> and then went back into the video store and really tried to hide and kind of like look at videos and not be recognized. And um, and one of his comments afterwards is. Jeez, mom, you take a really long time to have got a video. <laughs> but anyways, I finally got my video and went out, and like, huh, my car isn't here. <laughs> I thought I thought I left it here. Maybe I did. And I looked up the block. I got oh, there it is. And I just walked to it. And <laughs> it comes out afterwards. <laughs> it's like. What's wrong with you? <laughs> you know? It's like, like that, you know? It's like how we bump into whatever we think is going to happen next, whatever our expectations are. And, you know, that's a silly little story, but it happens all the time. It's like, oh, huh, isn't this interesting? I wonder what will happen next. Actually, one of my favorite characters in the... Uh, I like movies. <laughs> uh, Shakespeare and love um, uh, Jeffrey Rush character. He mostly is in a walk-on character that continually shows up throughout the movie saying, It's a mystery. It's a mystery. 
I wonder what will happen next. <laughs> Just a thought of, there's one other example I, <clears throat> of uh, letting go of that seriousness, which I noticed on the sports page a few weeks ago. This young guy from Texas, uh, I think his name is Jordan Speed, who won the Masters this year in some ex extraordinary performance. And there was a quote from him in the newspaper, and he said, the hardest thing in the world, the hardest thing, is to stop wanting to win and just let let the let your putter hit the ball. Um, or words to that effect. But I was very struck by <clears throat> this notion that letting go. It's it's not just it's not just oh whatever. It's actually it's actually the key to skillful action. Mm -hmm. And then another uh, other elaboration is, you know, letting go is also opening up to, um, which is always there. So there's always this, our living life, ever present. And I know it's, it's always a, a tender feeling of how one can be living one's life as if there is this one way to live life successfully and how limiting that is and how cramping that is because then there's no sense of humor, there's no sense of appreciation of the various displays of personality and, and delight. You know, it's almost as if uh, Rembrandt had to, you know, should I put this color here? or Van Gogh would doubt the fact that this brush stroke was right. You know, somehow to live spontaneously is, is trusting that innate goodness, that innate Buddha nature, that innate fullness. So then there's not such a self-consciousness. Um, I could tell a little bit when I was progressing along the path, so to speak, when, um, you know how you have, uh, you take walks and there's cement and sometimes there's a crack and you might trip. And I remember there was a phase where I used to, every time I would trip, I would look back and <laughs> highlight the fact that it was the crack that generated my trip in case anybody was watching. And that kind of self-consciousness of embarrassment about just being. And I could tell when I kind of moved through some generation of relaxation was when I could walk, trip, and keep walking without um, concern. So there's some playfulness that actually arises by um, letting go of this heavy um, container of ego and always this and that and containment about good and bad and that there's some natural vibrancy that we can live with. But it does take um, practice to let go of those deeply laden patterns of, of containment and right and wrong to allow the space to see the open, playful arena that one doesn't have to be embarrassed to be human. We have whole warehouses now full of old people. I'm now experiencing this with my mother who uh, are in this state where they're contained, uh, you know, they're, and they're not given permission to do anything other than be contained. Uh, and I, I'm uh, looking for, the, you know, the response to be able to help, uh, you know, this person, but perhaps others, figure out how you one lets go. One, one says, uh, you know, is this the, uh, you know, is this an existence that you want to take? Because all of the social stigmas are based on the idea that you're supposed to then just allow yourself to be warehoused, uh, you know, as a victim of the medical community, as opposed to having some kind of life that is uh, endemic there. And I'm, I'm not quite sure how to respond to this, how to how to talk it, uh, her or anybody about it. Just genuinely recognizing there is deep sadness in that that um, individuals can be warehoused and not be seen as vital beings who have sensibilities and 
of com accomplishments and have lost a sense of dignity by the convenience of warehousing and not having enough time and um, intuitive insight to draw out the individual's um, peculiar and particular greatnesses. Um, and then there's also challenges, true, when one ages, there can be mental challenges that make one's behaviors um, unsafe. And so sometimes there's practical details about how does one keep someone safe. But there's so many ways of maintaining safety while also always mirroring back to that individual their um, what a nature, their, their goodness, their uh, val validation as human being. So it's, it's a, a balance, and it's, it's hard to find the right thing within our society to provide those right environments to provide safety, to provide care, and also keep awake and attentive and present so that someone doesn't dull to their dignity and their um, their validness as human. Mm -hmm. I, I would just add that it's not just a social problem, it's a personal problem. I mean, how do I respond when my mother is dying or my mother is, is in a assisted living place that no longer really serves any particular function for her. And I think of that personal struggle, especially given the history <clears throat> that she carried for her mother and her home and back generations. That's how it was done. And now we have a different way. And it's and it's hard. We have we have the, the luxury. We have the uh, we live in this in, in a personal luxury to have these opportunities that weren't really available before, but it's still a struggle. You know, should I take my mother back into my own living room and care for her in that fashion? Uh, are we saving ourselves trouble? And it, but is that trouble something that we need to do in order to feel good about what we've done for our parents? I think, I think it's it's a societal issue, but it's also a very personal dilemma. And then there's also the dilemma of what's, what are we going to do? Who's going to care for us? Are we going to be warehoused like that? What are, how are we thinking about this? And what, what are we coming up with as an alternative if we don't like that? We're talking about letting go and impermanence. And um, if we look at the idea of dukkha, which is the idea of dissatisfaction, the dissatisfaction comes from the idea that the Buddha realized that greed, hatred, and ignorance creates the suffering. So the delusion part of it is that we do not realize that things are concocted of individual things that will not last forever, as our body is made up of parts. As we overlook it, we come up with the idea of I, which is the idea of the self, or me and mine, which is the wanting mind that creates the suffering. I'm interested in your view or perception of the other, the third realization that there is suffering, there is impermanence, and the idea of anatta, I think is the word. Um, in Sanskrit, it's atma, and in Pali, it's atta is self. Anatta is the idea of non self. I know, Alan, you were talking about it's good to have a self, and it is in our mundane existence, we have to use these tools in order to relate. But the essence of the Buddha's teaching, or the realization of the Buddha, that separated him from the Hindi, of the Atman, was the idea of non-self. So this non-self realization for us as individuals 
has to be looked into in a very deep way through, I feel, through a meditation practice. Because if we are made up of things, we're made up of form, feeling, perception, mental formations, and consciousness. This is what we think we are. But if we can pull these things apart, like a car, I got the word car and I got the word I, but if I take every piece of that car apart and put it out on the ground, there is no car, there are only parts. So I want to know, because I know through Tibetan there is the idea of reincarnation. But if I take that car apart, I don't find any substantial, permanent dynamic that continues. I love that because that allows me the freedom to realize my being and my being in progress. So this idea of non-self is something that I don't struggle with, but I'm interested in the sense. I feel it is the essence of the ability to let go, because if you don't understand this idea that you're really not there anyhow, if you're not there, you're free. So that's where it gives you the ability to feel at peace with your mother situation, because things are conditioned. You know, this arises, that arises. This doesn't arise, this doesn't. It's, it's basic physics in a sense. But the idea of non-self is very important because all institutional religions hold this idea of something that goes on for eternity. And it gives people a lot of satisfaction, but I think the liberation comes from non-self. So I'm just interested in, that was a very important part that separated Buddha from his culture. And I think it's very important for people, or for us to practice, to understand that, so that it is very easy to let go. Because the less of the idea of self, the more we can participate in the moment without prejudging it through perceptions that are through our conditioning. Amen. Okay. <laughs> as far as speaking, but I've just had a lot well, of Well, I think it's you know, extremely relevant to the discussion, you know, and what comes to my mind is just the whole uh, relationship between attachment and non-attachment, whether it's to a self or to your new car or, you know, whatever it might be, your profession. The relationship between attachment and letting go, because, I mean, I think, I think essentially what you're saying in relationship to this uh, conversation that we've had is um, in order to let go you can't be attached even to a self, right? Yes, yeah. so, because it's not there. Right. So, uh, uh, how, do we, how do we understand that? Yeah, uh, well, yeah. You want to take a stab at that? I do this all the time. I do this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> because I, 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 I don't do psychotherapy particularly though my, some of my students might disagree with that. Uh, but I do teach Buddhist ideas uh, very uh, repeatedly. It's a habit. Uh, <laughs> and I'm attached to it. <laughs> what you were talking about, what the, 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 we human beings, organisms, are compounds that are in process and dependent upon all kinds of conditions to stay alive. So there isn't a permanent something there, but there is content, there's a, a functional unity, a functional organization. A bunch of parts of a car on the floor is not going to take you anywhere. You put them in a, the right organization, and it's going to be functional, and it gets something done. And so in a sense, what, what, what um, Gendo was talking about is we have a functional organization that allows us to operate in the world, and it's really important. And it's, it's presupposed, really, uh, in many ways by the Buddhist tradition. Of course, we have this continuity over time. One of the problems is that we imagine that that is a, is a, is a unitary, unchanging entity. 
And this is, this, is the, this is the problem. This is the problem on the one side, what the Buddhists would call eternalism, the extreme of eternalism. And we try, we imagine that we have some eternal something, and reality hits us in the face every day. It causes problems. The other extreme, if I may, uh, is called the extreme of nihilism, uh, uchedavada, it is in Sanskrit, which is that things are cut off and that there is no continuity of the consequences of our actions over time. And it's very easy to think that if there's no essential unchanging unity or self, that therefore there's no continuity and consequences of our actions over time. And this is where the idea of karma comes in. And, and I like to think about karma, it, karma means action, and it also really means behavior in many ways. There, our behavior has consequences. We set up patterns, we set up behavioral patterns, we, we enact and reproduce emotional habit uh, patterns and cognitive and intellectual <coughs> patterns. Those patterns constitute a large part of what we are. So th those patterns have a kind of functional reality. You, can do you, anybody hear any bad habits? <laughs> so yeah. get rid of them. What's the matter? Just get rid of them, right? Anybody have a hard time getting rid of habits? One? <laughs> Those habits have this kind of inertial energy. And, and, and that is what makes it really difficult to let go. So even though those habits are not, not substances, that energy, that inertial energy in the patterns that we reenact moment to moment to moment are difficult to break because they, we are deeply, deeply attached to them. So they don't have to be an essential something to have a certain functional, pragmatic reality on our lives. And that's really what we're dealing with, is the functional, pragmatic reality of all of our, our habits that keep us trapped. And none of this has to do with substances or unchanging anything. It's all about, like, the riverbed and whether we can swim in it, so to speak, and get out of it when we choose to. An analogy that I found helpful over time, and it's a little bit of maybe an older analogy to the present age, but you know the um, uh, cinema where you used to have the reels and frame, gap, frame, gap, frame, gap, and um, to the degree that there's the speed of the reels, that creates the display. So you have the movie theater and you have all the activity happening there. But then if you slow down the reel, then you see it's just one frame, gap, one frame, gap, one frame. And so, you know, some of our Buddhist practice and meditation has to do with being able to slow down the speed of mind so that what becomes revealed is the space that is the background of all the display. It doesn't make it discreet, but it makes the fact that there is continuity of the, the light bulb behind the projector, the awareness that all of this is unfolding in. But if we're at such a heightened speed, we take that which is not solid and not continuous as continual, and then we keep chasing our own tail, trying to keep up with the speed of the display rather than holding the opportunity of sitting, resting, breathing, labeling thoughts, thinking, starting to develop a familiarity with that spaciousness that this is all taking place in, and then establishing some confidence in that larger field of accommodation, which is not mine or yours, but it's a space of awareness. Um, so it's a, a big field. I think we have, did, did anyone else want to respond? No. Mm. Maybe just to pick up on kind of like you're saying, in a, in, a, in a practice way, it's like when I was talking before about this kind of layering in, this unpacking, this slowing down enough that you're, it, it's, you're, it, it, it is a kind of unpacking of what is the thought, the emotion, the perception, the sensation. Not on an intellectual level, but just this kind of, you bump into the next edge of experience, 
and there's this openness to being curious about it, and that, that leads to kind of the next a kind of elusive thread, and that what happens is that pretty soon there's nothing there. You know, it, it just, it's the, it begins to dissolve. And I think that in this continual practice of, of opening in that way and being curious and exploring, not again from that direct experience way of knowing that we're continually reorganizing this relative self. It's continually reorganizing towards, um, actually towards emptiness, towards letting go. It's, it, you know, it's, we start to rest more and more in an open space of awareness where things can arise and pass away without getting caught. So it's not so sticky. <coughs> um. <clears throat> the way I think of this self question is uh, in, <clears throat> in terms of uh, just what, what's called in Buddhism discriminating consciousness. Um, I look out the window and I see darkness. <clears throat> I, I create an object in my mind of darkness. And <clears throat> Uh, there's also at the same time arising a self that sees the darkness. But what I think from, from the standpoint of Buddhism, that conclusion is missing a third piece, which is a prior experience of having looked out that window and having seen light and seen daytime. And the, the only way in which I know that darkness is an act of discrimination between light and dark. And that, <clears throat> that that discriminating consciousness is what makes the world of objects appear. <clears throat> but Buddhism points out that that darkness is not distinct or separate ultimately from the, from the daylight. That day and night exist together in the same way that in-breath and out-breath function together. And the one who discriminates day from night is the self. But if we hold the reality that day and night are happening together, then there is no discrimination. There's no self that's doing that activity of discrimination. So inherent, inher in that way, inherent, and of our inherent in our experience of the objective world is a foundational source, which is no self, which is uh, uh, a non a non objective truth that we cannot that we don't perceive with our senses in the way that we see a table or a chair that that inherent reality, that, that truth, ultimately, is not an object. Unless someone has a real urgent, simple question. Oh, Sarah. No. <laughs> okay, urgent, simple. Urgent, simple, and it's directed to Sharon. And I was interested in your analogy of the film and the, the frames and the gap. And I'd like to know what is the light bulb? <laughs> so there's different ways of approaching this. Um, but on, on some levels, what the, uh, the light bulb is, is that uh, radiant nature of mind that's always illuminating. It's not, we're not in an empty void. We're in a very... Uh, radiant realm of existence and mind is not dull. It's uh, brilliant and radiant and it's um, not ending, it's not beginning, it's an indestructible radiance. And so no matter what is the display, there's a radiant expression going out. So there's an illumination of our natural uh, uh, mind. So it's, it's not a dull mind, 
is a radiant um, mind. That's one way of expressing it. I think that's a perfect, perfect way to end the evening. Thank you. <laughs>